the change we are seeing in Zimbabwe means the country has the opportunity uh, to uh, kick start a fresh start and rebuild the economy and reintegrate internationally. Former Zimbabwean Finance Minister Tendai BT is a man well aware of having stabilized the economy during his uh, time. Mr. BT, thanks so much for your time. In your tenure as finance uh, minister, a lot of uh, praise uh, came to what you were able to do in stabilizing the uh, Zimbabwe financial system. Questions are, would you go back as finance minister if asked? Well, I think that it's not about the individual. It's about the task that needs to be uh, done. It's about the character of the individual we have to put there. Uh, and it's about the stamina of that uh, individual because uh, running an African economy is very tough because you are faced with a trilemma. And this trilemma consists of uh, huge expectations, huge demands, and a very low uh, fiscal base. So in order to balance the requires of the population, in order to navigate yourself when everything is priority of the priority, you have to be very smart, very bold, very honest, and you have to earn the trust of the people of Zimbabwe. And that is what is required right now. And of course, you have to have a plan, you have to have a vision of what you need to, uh, to do. And that's what I had uh, between 2009 and 2013. Mm. And if we're talking about a vision now from 2017, uh, five years on, I mean, Zimbabwe has uh, been regarded by many as being the albatross that's dragging the Southern Africa region uh, down. I mean, how do we make sure, what plan is to be put in place to grow uh, Zimbabwe in line with its African neighbors? It's a very important question. If you look at South Africa, say, GDP, for instance, you guys have been limping on GDP, embarrassing GDP growth rates of 1.2, 2.2% for the last uh, donkey years. You now have the junk status. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, we have basically weighed you down, as we have weighed down Zambia, mm -hmm. as we have down, uh, weighed down uh, Mozambique. So what Zimbabwe needs is a very strong economic uh, program that deals with, with its three of its fundamental problems. Number one, the economy is it's very cyclical. So one has to adopt a very robust fiscal policy that ensures and deals with this uh, cyclicality. So an anti-cyclical fiscal policy. Number two, it's our accumulation model. If you were to work this with John Rhodes right now, you wouldn't get lost because the accumulation model is still that of extraction and, uh, and the export of raw materials, whether it's uh, tobacco, whether it's platinum, gold, and so forth. So we have to change our accumulation uh, model. Number three is the management of the economy, the hygiene of the economy. Uh, in the past uh, is, is, uh, five years, for instance, this government has been running this economy through deficit financing with the challenge that we now have a domestic debt. We now have a, sorry, a budget deficit that is 25% of expenditure, 60% of uh, GDP. So we have to go back to basics macroeconomic uh, stability, what I used to call when I was minister, we eat what we kill. Number two, we need structural reforms, deep structural reforms, and all reforms require pain. I always argue that when you go to a doctor, you get medicine, and there is no medicine that tastes like a fanta, that tastes like a cherry plum. Medicine is medicine, and Zimbabweans have to understand the pain of that uh, austerity. Number three, we have to deal with investment, remove the Indigenization Empowerment Act. Mm. Number four, we have to deal with our competitiveness. It's a crime that uh, on the World Economic Forum ease of doing business and on the World Bank Global Competitiveness Report, we are ranked number 176 out of 179 with the three countries we are doing better being Afghanistan and Syria. So in competitiveness is important. Number six, we have to grow this economy. I would submit that we can grow this economy at an average rate in real terms of 7% per annum. And I would like to submit that with a correct team there, we can build a 100 billion US dollar economy in under uh, 15 years. Then the next thing is, of course, Zimbabwe's crippling self-sovereign debt of 15 billion US dollars. We have to deal with that. And then lastly, gross, gross capital formation infrastructure. We are the port or capital of Southern Africa with great respect to the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are the blackout capital of Southern Africa 
So, so a lot of things have, have to happen, and the Minister of Finance is going to be very, very key. Well, 7% per annum, that's a growth similar to what the Chinese have been achieving for a number of years. We were speaking with uh, Trevor Nguba, a Zimbabwean businessman, Mr. BT. He was saying what's also important is the introduction of a national uh, currency, one that is uh, trusted. I mean, how do we go about doing that? Look, uh, I'm not in favor of the immediate introduction of a currency. So my proposal is that we demonetize the, the quasi currency known as the bond notes, and we formally make an application to join the Rand Monetary Union. This is a process that normally takes about four years. So within that four years, we attend to fiscal convergence. South Africa and members of, other members of the Rand Monetary Union would want, wouldn't want us to export our challenges to that region. So the four years will be a period of fiscal consolidation so that we have the same fiscal convergence figures, i.e. the net present value of our debt to GDP, the net present value of our exports to GDP, uh, our capital account, our current account. The lesson we have learned from Greece and other European countries is that it's not enough to have monetary convergence without fiscal convergence as well. So four years will allow Zimbabwe to reach a position of fiscal convergence with the majority of countries in the Rand Monetary Union. And what about the, 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 the conversation about opening up Zimbabwe more uh, to the West, which uh, uh, Mugabe had alienated in the infamous uh, speech where he told uh, Prime Minister, well, then Prime Minister Tony Blair, to keep his UK and he'll keep his Zimbabwe. But uh, the role of opening up or the importance of opening up uh, the West uh, to uh, Zimbabwe, uh, how important do you think that is? Well, firstly, Firstly, Zimbabwe is very integrated with the West. We have a, a, our, our second biggest trading partner is the United Kingdom after, after South Africa. And in fact, China is like number five after countries like, like Germany and the United States of America. So we are integrated. However, the politics has been toxic. So Zimbabwe has to engage in proper re-engagement uh, with its as well friends. We have to make friends uh, with London. We have to make friends with Washington, D.C. We have to make friends with the New York and capital in, in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and, and California. We have to make friends with, the, with the Brussels. And of course, we have to find a new relationship with the Beijing. We have to find a new relationship with the New Delhi. And of course, we have to have accompanying policies that allows foreign direct investment in this country. And I would submit that as a matter of agency, we need to repeal the Indigenization and Empowerment Act we need to liberalize our capital account. And, and, and so there's a lot of software and hardware things that we have to do, and it can be done. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, if we put the right team in government, within six months, Zimbabweans can feel the change. The international community can feel the change. And I have no doubt that the international community will loosen their pay strings uh, if we have the right team that can be trusted. The biggest deficit of Mugabe and Patrick Chinamasa, the former Minister of Finance, has been lack of confidence, lack of trust. I hope that uh, the new team that will come will understand that it has to create a team and that we have to build confidence amongst the Zimbabweans and externally with countries like South Africa, with countries like uh, Nigeria, uh, Botswana, Zambia, and of course the big powers and the big boys that I've just spoken of. And uh, Mr. BT, you did speak about your relationship with Beijing, and some have criticized that relationship between Zimbabwe and China as being uh, too close. I mean, what are the risks of that relationship erupting in a situation like we have here in South Africa, where essentially you have got a, a certain uh, uh, creed or a certain family that has captured the state? Is the Zimbabwe uh, state at risk of being captured? The Guptas, yes, sir. Thanks for calling a spade a spade. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we have to have a relationship with China. China is the world's second largest economy. That's why I said we have to rebalance this uh, 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 relationship, uh, 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 no pun intended. Uh, the reason is that it has been a one-way street relationship. It has been an unequal relationship. So we need China, but we have to rebalance the relationship, the relationship has to be one based on equality 
and, and respect. Some years ago, as finance minister, April 2010 in particular, I was in China speaking to the then president of the Afri Chinese Import and Export Bank, Mr. Li Ryok, and they were lending money to us at something like 17% on the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Yet, and I brought to his attention that, well, they were lending money to the United States dollars, trillions of dollars, about $2 trillion dollars at 0.75%, mm -hmm. and, and I sorry, 0.75 points. And I said, this is unequal. So we have to rebalance our relationship with China to make sure that it's equal, it's even, it's fair. But we as Zimbabwe also have to pay our debts and pay them on time so that it's, a, it's an equal relationship. And then in terms of uh, getting uh, foreigners uh, to part with their cash, uh, one thing that's very important is them knowing uh, the extent of the risk profile of doing that. And the way you can do that is allowing your country to be rated by ratings agencies. As I understand, Zimbabwe currently doesn't have that. So would the plan also be to engage with ratings agencies for them to accurately assess the risk to the uh, lender there uh, in Zimbabwe? Absolutely. Remember, I spoke about competitiveness. We want to be competitive so that we'll be rated. But the, other, the biggest thing against our rating is our debt, our sovereign debt, which is unsustainable, which is now about 120% of GDP. And the stem, we need a stamp of approval from the IMF. So we have to have a program, an upper tier staff monitored program with the IMF so that we get that necessary stamp of, uh, of, of approval. And it follows a fortiori that once we uh, um, uh, make order and make peace with the fund, it's then easier for us to access international markets. And we can't in access international markets, private equity funds, without a rating. I'm craving for a rating, and I know that within a short period of time, we can get a B plus, which will graduate to an A minus and an A plus. And finally, Mr. Beatty, uh, many people drawing parallels between uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa, not only because we're close neighbors, but because the developments that have unfolded in both countries have been so similar. What lessons uh, can South Africa learn from what has happened in Zimbabwe? I think that uh, while these comparisons are there, they should be exaggerated. What you, one thing that you guys have is a, is a strong constitution and a strong judiciary. So you are very lucky uh, there in that you've got a powerful constitution. You also have a powerful uh, media. But having said that, South Africa must refuse to be seduced by the dangers of corruption, of capture, uh, and coercion. What I call in one word the zanification of the South African state. You people must resist the zanification of your state. You must refuse powerful monopolistic presidents who think they're the end all and be all. And thank God you've got a constitution that uh, uh, limits terms of office. And thank God we were able to, to fight President Becky at Polokwane to prevent him having a third term at, uh, uh, in the ANC. That is very important. Number two, you must not trust anyone. You must build your society based on mistrust. Greatest societies are built on mistrust not on a, 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 a trust. I hope and pray that there will be order in the ANC because without a stable ANC, South Africa will be uh, unstable. This is with great respect to the DA, to the EF, and other 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 parties in uh, in South Africa. They are important, but for now the ruling party is still important, and instability in the ruling party sometimes cross and spreads in the nation state. The last thing you want in South Africa is violence. The last thing you want in South Africa is the seduction, the temptation of your soldiers coming from the barracks and getting on the streets. Mr. Beatty, thank you so much for those insights. I will let you go. And now that was a former Zimbabwean finance minister, uh, Tendai Beatty.